time, and I want to provide a few insights of um, what has happened so far and what we can expect from a new international climate agreement. Um, I will have three points. Um, the first point is uh, the EU has saved the climate negotiations, and I will explain why I think that is so, but not yet the climate. And we will look at what where we add right now and whether the activities that are ongoing are sufficient or not. And then, well, they are not yet. And then the third point is we need an emergency plan. So we need something in addition to the international climate negotiations in support of and in addition to. So these are the three points. So I will go now uh, explain to you uh, uh, these three points. Uh, for the first point, uh, the EU has saved the climate negotiations. I really want to go a bit backwards and start um, more than 20 years ago in 1992 when the international climate negotiations started. And I think this, this travel uh, from uh, 20 years ago to today is uh, helpful in understanding how this process works and uh, then also helpful in understanding what to expect from it in the next two years. Um, so the uh, United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, was agreed in 1992. It's a framework contract. It is 192 countries at that point in time were a member of it, and they make all decisions by consensus. That means no single country disagrees to anything that's decided there. And um, that already is very difficult. You can imagine 192 countries trying to get an agreement uh, with no country objecting to what's written. And that's why the... Um, the decisions that you get out of that are often uh, not very specific, and the way they are called is uh, constructive ambiguity. So they're ambiguous on purpose so that everybody can subscribe to them, although they interpret a little bit of a different thing into it. And that, I will give you two examples. In 1992, in that framework um, uh, treaty, they um, agreed uh, the overall objective of this treaty to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. They did not define what dangerous means, but they got that much of, agree of an agreement that they should prevent it from being dangerous. What it will mean, that has to be specified later. And a second example where there's constructive ambiguity was in one principle that's of very often quoted afterwards, and that is um, that parties, that is in this case countries, they're called parties because they're party to the agreement, uh, they should protect the climate system on the basis of equity and in accordance with common but differentiated responsibilities and capabilities. That basically says that countries are different, some have more responsibility for climate, some less, and some also have more capabilities and some less. That's still a vague sentence, but at least the following sentence specifies it to some extent. It says that developed country parties should take the lead in combating climate change. That's a specification, but it doesn't, it's not very detailed. It simply says that. And already at that point in time, countries were grouped in two groups, developed countries, which were put in the Annex 1 uh, of the convention uh, of this document so that are the developed countries, and all countries that are not listed in this Annex are called non-Annex 1 countries, so developing countries, at least from the perspective of 1992. That was uh, the agreement then. So developed country, uh, dangerous interference is to be avoided, and developed countries need to take the lead. <clears throat> it then took a while uh, until 1997 to agree on a first step, the Kyoto Protocol, and then another four years to agree on rules uh, for this Kyoto Protocol. And it is basically an implementation of that principle. It says that developed countries need to take the lead. That's why developed countries have uh, emission reduction targets in this treaty. Uh, of 5% yeah, below 1990 in a certain period, 
and it also included some flexibility in reaching the targets through international emission trading and joint implementation and the clean development mechanism. That is all mechanisms how countries help each other to meet their targets. But in principle, it's a step towards um, um, having developed countries take the lead. Now, you all know that at that point in time, there was George W. Bush, Bush saying, that's not fair. Um, uh, the treaty of the Kyoto Protocol is not fair because it's only for developed countries, and they uh, at that point did not agree with this common but differentiated responsibility and dropped out of the Kyoto Protocol. So their uh, main point was no Kyoto Protocol, first a treaty with all countries. Then, on the other hand, there was uh, many developing countries, and let's uh, let's put China here as one example, but it was definitely from many other countries. They said the opposite. First, the Kyoto Protocol, because we agreed developed countries take the lead, and then uh, we can think about the treaty for all countries. And this stalemate basically um, caused uh, um, the international negotiations to go to a sleep mode, so to say, and they tried uh, to find a compromise in 2007, um, that is here in 2007 in Bali. The compromise was that they would negotiate both uh, on the Kyoto Protocol and on an agreement for all countries in parallel and hope to solve the problem in 2009 um, in the big Copenhagen uh, conference. They. Um, did not agree and did not resolve this conflict. So many said that the Copenhagen uh, conference failed. It definitely was uh, falling behind expectations. But from my point of view, two important things happened here. One important thing was that they agreed that global temperature increase is to be limited to two degrees. That is a specification of this term, dangerous interference with the climate system. Um, so, um, 1992, it was just dangerous interference. Now, in 2009, it was an agreement that it should be two degrees uh, temperature increase, not more. So, that's much more specific. Still vague, but much more specific. And another thing happened, that is that many countries, actually all major emitters, have submitted uh, greenhouse gas reduction targets for 2020. And given the situation before that countries said, well, developed countries first need to put targets on the table before developing countries put targets on the table, that's, um, that's remarkable that in that period, uh, 2009, we had all major emitters putting emission reduction targets, quantifiable targets, on, um, on the table. So that was, although Copenhagen was uh, classified as a failure by some, I think these two elements are very important. Now, what happened next? <clears throat> but it took another year to formalize this, uh, um, to really put it into a decision that everybody could agree to. That was in 2010. But then still, we actually still had the same situation. US was actually still saying we are not willing to support the Kyoto Protocol. Um, we want first a treaty with all countries. And actually, all many developing countries, including China, said we want first a treaty, uh, sorry, first the Kyoto Protocol, and then a treaty with all countries. So that uh, difference in opinion we had already in um, 2001 uh, was still there in 2010, 10 years later, basically. And now, what is a good way out of it? And that was basically a proposal by the EU. The EU said, well, we can go along with the Kyoto Protocol without the US and without those countries that will not participate. And uh, in, in effect, it's actually only the EU with a few other developed countries uh, taking on targets. Um, but we will only do that unilateral move on the Kyoto Protocol without the US if we have a date when we agree on a treaty that encompasses all countries. That was the proposal of the EU at that time, and actually also the agreement that was made at that time, that was in, in Durban in South Africa in 2011, 
that one was agreeing that Kyoto Protocol would be continued by the European Union and a few others. Um, then um, we have uh, a period uh, which is called the Durban Platform. That is the um, um, a new process that will discuss uh, the new climate agreement, and they said it would be agreed in 2015, um, which is the conference in Paris, and it would also enter into force only in 2020. So that's basically we have, with this agreement in Durban, have uh, solved a conflict that was there already 10 years ago that basically started in 2001 uh, on whether we should continue the Kyoto Protocol or not. Whether it's really solved or not, that's to be seen in Paris. If uh, we really agree on a future agreement in Paris, then that has been solved. If it should fail in Paris, well, then we still have the, the same conflict. So far, so good. Um, so this is, uh, you see here, then the overview of uh, what is happening, just a different way of displaying it. The last, um, well, as we said, in Durban was the last conference where this was agreed. Um, that was basically four years before 2015. That means we already had one conference in Doha where officially the other two tracks were closed. We had a conference in Warsaw, which is basically an in-between conference where no major decisions were expected on the way towards a 2015 agreement uh, that is to be agreed in Paris. Um, there's always a talk that we do not have an international climate agreement. Um, well, we do not have the all-encompassing international climate agreement that uh, uh, is legally binding for everybody, but we do have quite some elements. And uh, let me repeat uh, two important ones again. We have one element that says that all countries agree to limit global temperature increase to two degrees. Um, we also have emission reduction proposals from all countries, all major emitters on the table for 2020, and I'll show a few uh, a bit later. We do have a Kyoto Protocol, which is limited to um, a very small number of countries, but at least it is there, has very moderate targets until 2020, but, well, it's still continuing. And we have some additional elements in this whole process of uh, negotiations. We have a commitment or a willingness of developed countries to provide significant financing or mobilize financing in the order of 10 billion per year until mobilizing an order of 100 billion a year by 2020. There is an agreement that there is a green climate fund as a new financing channel. Um, um, to get there, um, and there is a, there's also new forms of uh, collaboration um, on uh, helping countries uh, to uh, reduce their emissions, uh, like a, a thing that is called nationally appropriate mitigation actions, where countries support each other in reducing emissions, or also another form of cooperation is the clean development uh, mechanism or forestry. Finally, I think that it's also uh, new is that we now have um, reporting, regular reporting of all countries starting now that uh, all countries have to report their greenhouse gas emissions and also their policies, what they're doing on a biannual basis, so every two years. I just see a, a comment here in the comment window that I forgot the 2014 conference. That's correct. In 2014, in between Warsaw and Paris, there's a conference in Lima, which is also very important in Peru as an important step towards, um, um, towards the 2015 agreement. But well, every, the showdown really is in 2015. All right, that was um, uh, the, the process so far. So what do we expect to be in a future agreement? And well, there's diff all different views on what should be in there. Um, my personal view is that uh, I hope there is something in there on a global goal. Um, we said dangerous interference was the first one. Then 
uh, two degrees was the further clar uh, clarification. And I would hope that there's even more clarification on this global goal. And one proposal that is on the table uh, from the research community, of, you see the link here on the bottom, is to uh, specify this as a phase out of global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or by another year. Um, that would further, even further specify this global goal. That's one option. Then uh, I think everybody expects national emission reduction commitments. Some have now called them contributions, um, um, but that's semantics. It's all that countries are proposing something, what they are willing to do. Um, then um, I expect that there will be something on commitments for financial contributions as well where developed countries uh, would put money on the table for adaptation and mitigation. And um, I assume also that there will be uh, more details on measures and goals for adaptation. As I said, there's one, uh, one proposal uh, from the research community on the table that we uh, worked uh, on as well. And the idea here was uh, that countries um, propose their own um, uh, they make their own proposal on what kind of a commitment they uh, want to um, make, and they make that commitment together with an explanation why they think it is equitable. Um, they provide an emission reduction target or some other contribution, and at the same time they explain why this is an equitable contribution. Then in this process, in this proposal, um, uh, there would be a technical review of those um, proposals and questions could be asked to the countries why they, why they have done it in the way they've done it. If it is technically correct, then it would be entering into the final agreement. If it is not technically correct, then the country could basically um, uh, refine their proposal and then it would go through and would finally be in the 2015 agreement with a commitment for the 2020 to 2023 timeframe. And afterwards, there would be more ambitious uh, commitments for following periods. That indeed is only one, um, um, this is only one way of how a 2015 agreement could look like. But I think some of these elements will definitely be in there. For example, that countries provide uh, their own proposal on what they are willing to do in the future. Now, this has been my first point. First point was EU has saved the climate negotiations. We have a clear track what should happen in the next two years. Um, there's a clear goal. Everybody agrees to go for this goal and um, to um, yeah, uh, come to an agreement. Oh, uh, to come to an agreement um, with this. Uh, Fernando, I just uh, probably clicked the wrong button and uh, I'm missing now the uh, the slides. I, uh, somehow, no so problem. Maybe you can do that and, again. Um, again. Okay. Excellent. Should Sorry for that. Now that was the first point. Now the second point: Did we already save the climate? And well, you all know probably not. Um, this is a um, a um, picture that we prepared for this project, the Climate Action Tracker, where we are looking at what countries have proposed for the 2020 timeframe and what would that mean for emission reductions. And you can see on this picture uh, global greenhouse gas emissions um, from 1990 to 20, uh, 2050. And the black line here is the uh, historical greenhouse gas emissions, and the um, uh, gray line is where c emissions would be uh, if we just run for business as usual. Um, so generally for some countries emissions are declining, but for most they're increasing. Then if you calculate what countries have put on the table, their individual reduction proposals for 2020 and beyond, you come to this uh, more darker red line and you can see the, there is some reduction between the business as usual and what they're proposing to do by 2020. 
but not that much. And also in later, uh, uh, if you go further, the commitments that countries have made, they do lead to more or less stabilization of the global greenhouse gas emissions. And if you translate that into temperature increase, um, we, we get somewhere around three and a half degrees uh, by the end of the century and a sea level rise of a meter and a serious um, uh, risk that the Amazon forest, for example, is dying back. That's definitely not compatible with two degrees. There's uh, two more scenarios here that are compatible with two degrees. That's the orange one, which basically needs, says that emissions need to peak immediately, more or less, and then move, go down significantly to relatively low levels by the middle of the century already. And then you are on a pathway towards two degrees, still significant sea level rise and widespread uh, coral bleaching. Some countries have uh, said uh, one, two degrees is, is not enough. It should be 1.5 degrees. So they have, um, uh, we have also included a scenario here for 1.5 degrees, which requires even more drastic reductions on a global level. And um, still uh, results in significant sea level rise and some impacts. But the main point here is that the proposals that countries have made for 2020 are not in line with what is necessary for reaching two degrees. And we've heard that the international climate agreement, the new one, is entering into force only after 2020. So, um, oh, but already until 2020, there's a very huge gap um, to what has to happen to be compatible with two degrees. So indeed, uh, the 2020, the new agreement has to do something already about the emission level in 2020. Otherwise, it would be very, very difficult to really meet this goal of two degrees. Um, well, this is one analysis. Uh, there have been several analyses of these and, and combined in, in the UNEP GAP report, uh, a report by the United Nations Environment Program, and it's basically now well established that there is a gap between what countries have pledged and what is necessary to move towards two degrees. Let me show you three countries um, that um, I want to go into detail on what they have proposed and what they are doing. First one is the EU, and again, these are pictures from a the project, the Climate Action Tracker, where we look at these recent historical emissions. This is the picture for the EU, where you have historical emissions from 1990 until 2011, in this case, where you have uh, the d dark lines are the commitments, in this case, under the Kyoto Protocol. So the EU had first commitment period uh, pro uh, uh, commitment of this level, minus eight, more or less, and has a second commitment period um, commitments under the Kyoto Protocol of this level, and uh, has an own goal of reducing emissions by 85, 80 to 95% by 2050. In this um, project, the Climate Action Trail, we evaluated whether we think uh, according to different uh, ways to share global emission reductions, whether uh, the proposal that the country has made is in line with uh, two degrees or not. And you can see that here in a colorful way, red is not in line and uh, red would be not in line and dark green would be in line or even better than the proposals on the table on how to fairly share the global emission budget in the year 2020. And you can see here that the EU has made a proposal to reduce its emissions by 20% below 1990 uh, that is the target that has also been translated into the target for the Kyoto Protocol. And EU is willing to go to minus 30%, which is probably somewhere here, if there is a global agreement, but currently it's still the, the minus 20%. Um, so that's, and the 20% are, according to our analysis would not be in the range which is compatible with two degrees yet. 30 would be, but 20 not. Now, the EU has quite a lot of uh, policies in place, uh, very significant policies supporting renewables, emission trading system, efficiency standards, so a very comprehensive policy package. And with these policies, the current estimated trend, that's the blue line here, is actually 
already uh, foreseen to overachieve uh, the Kyoto target, which they have set themselves, and overachieve this minus 20% target that is now uh, coming from the Cancun agreements. So the EU is actually a country that has made a pledge and will overachieve its pledge with the current policies. Um, EU is already uh, one of the few countries that has thought about a new target for 2030, and they've said um, a proposal is on the table to reduce emissions uh, 40% below 1990 in 2030. That would be somewhere, and that, uh, well, it's not a decision, it's a proposal. So people are still thinking about how it can be done and whether it should be a target. Now, next country uh, of particular interest is the U.S. <clears throat> the U.S. has, well, retreated from the Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol target was somewhere around here. It was a minus uh, 6 or 7 percent from 1990 in the, around 2010. Well, they have not supported this target, so it's not going here. You see the historical emissions. They have peaked in more or less 2005 gone down also because of the economic crisis. <clears throat> and um, the current projections, the recent trend with their policies is relatively flat, which is due to some policies and also due to the um, uh, recent developments in shale gas. So there's limited coal use and more use of gas in the US, and that also drives down their expected trends. It's, it's more or less uh, straight right now. The U.S. has pledged uh, internationally to reduce its emissions 17% uh, below 2005. That's the large dot here. And um, the U.S. has, uh, uh, middle of last year, put forward a new climate plan. Um, if this plan is implemented, then um, some analysis suggests that if it is really implemented, then they can still reach this minus 70%. Um, that is possible, but um, the current plan is not yet fully implemented. That's why we have here in this picture a current trend which is above. But if the plan is implemented, then this target could be reached. Again, this target, if you look at different ways to share the effort, is outside of that range. That means that, well, it's rated here as not, not being sufficient for two degrees. Then one last country that I want to look at is China. <clears throat> And China, um, well, is currently the largest emitter. Here we show again global greenhouse gas emissions um, of all greenhouse gases. They have been increasing significantly in the last five years. They are now at, at uh, yeah, the order of 10, 11, 12 uh, gigatons. Uh, and that is as much as, uh, almost as much as EU and US together. So it's definitely growing very, very fast. There is significantly more people in China, so if you look at it on a per capita basis, that's still uh, comparable. Actually, the per capita emissions are comparable to those in the EU, but uh, significantly lower than those in the US. China has uh, provided a business as usual scenario. This is actually the business as usual scenario that China itself provided that excludes any policies that they introduced after 2005. And, um, they also provided a scenario which, which they are aiming for, that's the, the, which we took as their interpretation of, their, of the pledge. Um, and that is uh, still uh, increasing emissions, but at a much slower speed. China has pledged not an absolute target, but a reduction of CO2 emissions per unit of GDP of 40 to 45%, and a share of uh, non-fossil fuels of 15% and some additional uh, forest-related uh, measures. That's the international pledge. And I think it's very remarkable that China also has a lot of national policies. Um, to name a few, there's a top 10,000 company program supporting them to, to supporting these companies to um, uh, reduce their energy use and emissions. Uh, their support for renewable energy in, in many cases, also through the CDM, for example. There are some low carbon zones uh, that are uh, cities uh, that are uh, really looking into reducing their overall greenhouse gas emissions. China is implementing emission trading systems as a pilot. 
has efficient standards for cars and trucks. And I think another one that is remarkable from my point of view is a regional, uh, three regions have banned the uh, building of new coal-fired power plants for air pollution reasons, not, for, not necessarily for climate reasons, but for air pollution reasons. And I think that's a quite significant uh, measure, as many of the other measures. Still, implementing all of these measures, uh, we at least estimate that their current trend is somewhere in that direction. It's very difficult to really estimate where it's going. Um, but it's more in the area that they are likely to achieve their international pledge. That was China, uh, these three major countries. Um, I think you've seen in the three countries that quite a lot is happening, and that's actually a trend that I would say is, is, uh, is the same in many countries. We've shown here in this slide um, two snapshots, one in 2007 and one in 2012, of countries that have national climate policy. And the real, we have the international negotiations to drive that nationally there are policies implemented to reduce emissions. And even though we do not have a legally binding international agreement for many countries, we do have nationally binding climate legislation in quite a few countries, and significantly more now than we had in 2007. Uh, you can see on the top picture the situation in 2007. It's a global map, and it's, uh, the, the area of the countries is scaled to the emissions that these countries had in 2010. So you get an order of magnitude of how much of the emissions is covered by these laws. You can see in dark blue uh, the countries that have nationally binding um, a law uh, that is related to greenhouse gas emission reductions. You can see where well, the EU has its, had its Kyoto uh, Protocol implementation. You had that in, in Japan. You have it in, in Canada. And you already have in lighter blue uh, climate uh, strategies, um, those countries that had politically binding climate strategies and a coordination body to really implement them. Um, you have um, um, here uh, a few countries which have that, China and Mexico at that time, also Argentina or here Indonesia. If you look at the picture in 2012, you have a lot more countries which have legally bind nationally binding climate policy. And remarkable from my point of view is Mexico, Brazil, Australia, South Korea, which have implemented national climate laws which are on, on their level binding and which are working towards reducing emissions. And also the, um, well, China we put in here as well because it's included in the five-year plan which has a similar status. And you can see other countries which moved into the second category with climate strategies that are binding. Um, that is the um, yeah, countries like India and South Africa. But the main message from this picture is that there is definitely um, uh, uh, policy making activity on the ground in the developing countries and in the developed countries to reduce emissions. Is it all enough? Um, no, it's happening, but it is not enough in total. And uh, sorry for another uh, more complicated slide. But it's showing the same we've seen before. It's showing the business as usual, this time as a shaded area. It is showing the red line, which you've seen before, what, is, what countries have pledged to do. And here on the bottom, you see three pathways towards two degrees, more or less, or 1.5. Um, the new thing on this picture is the blue line here, which is the recent trend. And we see with all the policies implemented, we find that until 2020, um, countries, if you aggregate over them, they were more or less in line with what they've pledged. The pledges are far away from what is necessary towards two degrees, but at least these pledges in total will be implemented in the short term. In the long term, not yet. So there's some uh, longer term pledges that are not uh, seen in policies yet. So there's significant activity happening, but there's a lot more to happen if we really want to be on a pathway towards two degrees. 
And we also say that the, 20, uh, the new climate agreement will only kick in after 2020. So it will basically be too late if we are not, um, um, uh, if nothing happens before that. So that's why, uh, coming back to my three points, we had just seen that we have not saved the climate yet. That's why we need an emergency plan. And I'll quickly go through that and then leave some time for questions. The idea, <clears throat> uh, I think, uh, that we had in the beginning, uh, 20 years ago, uh, a simple view of how this would work is that we have um, an international treaty, and that will then drive national government action, and then we have solved the problem. I think what is, um, that is the simple view. Um, what is more emerging is the complex view, which you see on the right-hand side, and uh, I borrowed that picture from the draft IPCC report, which I think is, is um, uh, uh, showing this very nicely, is that we have a more complex uh, view that there's many things happening, not only the UNFCCC, it is shown at the center here, but we have many different uh, um, things that are also working towards reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There are, for example, um, um, other elements that are happening. There are multi, um, other multilateral clubs that are trying to reduce and influence uh, national policies and actions. For example, the G20 is talking about climate change and also has an input there. There is um, uh, other partnerships around cities, for example. They are uh, also setting themselves targets um, and uh, trying to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, or they even come together as transnational networks to do that. You have um, activities by uh, regions like uh, California or state of Sao Paulo trying to reduce their emissions and bring these people together. You have activities by, um, by industry or in this case the investor community to come together to uh, try to reduce emissions everywhere. So it's not only the international climate agreement that you have to put in place and then the problem is solved. It's much more complex and I think we have to work towards looking at all of these different actors to reduce their emissions and to pull in the same direction and that these things are reinforcing each other. We have done a thought experiment which we called wedging the gap. Um, what could be certain initiatives that could be implemented uh, that would drive short-term emission reductions already by 2020 and help uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and by that help to uh, raise the ambition level. And again, in this picture you see on the left-hand side the same picture that you've seen before but a bit different. That is the global greenhouse gas emissions under business as usual on the top and on the bottom where they should be for two degrees and in the middle somewhere where we would be if the countries would implement what they have pledged internationally. And on the right-hand side, you have different um, contributions that we think are possible from a few of these initiatives. And these initiatives from cities, from regional governments, from companies, from sectors, um, they would all overlap with each other and they would overlap with what, co company, uh, what governments have pledged. But in total, even if you account for that overlap, there's significant potential that more is happening. You cannot do it with one initiative, but if you put all the initiatives together, it's quite possible to do that as a thought experiment. On this slide, you see a more de or you can see a bit more detailed what we thought of these initiatives. We have a lot on energy efficiency, which uh, I think there is quite some potential that could be done. There's something on energy supply, in particular renewable energy that could be supported. This was our, our idea at that time. Um, I think the idea was taken up by the um, international negotiations and also by the UNEP uh, emissions gap reports. And UNEP has um, identified four focus areas where short-term emission reductions could be uh, achieved already before 2020. And these topic areas 
um, they have uh, uh, identified is yeah, energy efficiency with significant potential already until 2020. Another area is fossil fuel subsidy reform. There's a lot of subsidies in countries that are basically supporting fossil fuels and therefore increasing emissions. Um, then um, uh, methane uh, and other short-lived climate pollutants is also something that uh, a lot of studies and governments as well think is short-term reductions can happen here before 2020. And another one is renewable energy, which also would have a large potential um, in the long term. So I would like to end here um, with giving you a little bit of insight on uh, what I think uh, is the current situation. We have a international process that is uh, more or less has a goal for an international agreement by 2015. I think that's uh, um, a very important, but it alone will not be able to um, save the climate or keep temperature to two degrees. And I think we need something in addition in support of the international climate negotiations to really keep climate change to two degrees, if that's what uh, we all want. So I'll stop here and I uh, thank you for your attention so far and I look forward to your questions. Okay, hey, <coughs> thank you, Nicholas, for your interesting presentation today. So let's go for um, some questions and answers. So please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A uh, pod. We will be uh, treating the, the questions one by one. Meanwhile, we have already received something, so let's uh, proceed with it. The first question, when you were talking about China, um, it seems that something mentioning uh, burning coal plants uh, was indicated. So uh, maybe any clarification on this? Thank you. Yes. Um, no, uh, don't misunderstand. I did not say China in total is banning any new coal-fired power plants. That is not the case, definitely. Um, uh, it is the case that in three uh, provinces of China, a certain uh, types of coal-fired power plants cannot be built anymore uh, for air pollution reason, uh, reasons. So indeed, uh, they have been banned but only in, a specific, in three specific provinces and only for very specific type of coal-fired power plants. But in, for those, they have been banned. For more information, there's a nice blog. It's called China Facts, um, which is done by LBNL and, and WRI, which is uh, very nice and where you can find more details. Hey, thank you. So we would have another question. Canada had the national climate legislation, but then abolished and only kept the strategy. Yeah, um, in the picture that I showed on uh, climate legislation and climate strategies, indeed, um, in, if you look at it in total, there's more countries now which have nationally binding climate strategies that, than there were before. But there's two cases where there's also movements backwards, and that was Canada. Canada had a, a nationally binding Kyoto Implementation Act, and that is now abolished, and uh, they have retreated from that. So that's why uh, they are now rated differently in this picture. Um, also, uh, Australia is a uh, candidate where they have implemented a very strict uh, new, for, for uh, I think, Australian uh, uh, standards, a very strict new climate law with the uh, uh, carbon pricing mechanism. But the new government that is now in power has said it would repeal that. So that would definitely be a step backwards. These are two examples where national climate laws are going backwards. Um, but um, uh, in total, I would still see it's going forwards. But well, it's always some, some back and forth here. So another question, will not the development of local climate modeling affect countries' commitment related to global solutions? Yeah, I think um, I did not touch a lot about the impacts of climate change. Um, the issue here is that the impacts of climate change are very severe. 
And I think if nothing happens, so if we are going towards the more 3.5 degrees, 4 degrees world, then impacts will be very severe, not only for developing countries, but also for developed countries. The real issue here is that these impacts are fell, uh, one, un uh, large uncertainties here on when and how they will happen, and second, they are happening in the future. And that's why I think um, these, um, this argument of impacts or the fear argument has been very difficult and has not moved countries to move uh, to reduce their emissions. I think one should keep up that argument, but I think for now it has not helped them to really do something. I think the argument of saying that climate change is, uh, can be, or emission reductions can be a co-benefit of other things that you do that are good for your local air pollution, that are good for regional development, that are good for jobs, that argument is, I think, much more interesting for short-term thinking decision makers. Um, I think you can take both, but I think the one, the, uh, one on thinking of it as an opportunity is, is uh, from my perspective, uh, one that can drive uh, more action than the fear argument of impact. Okay, good. Uh, a question about the European Commission announcing very an ambitious targets for CO2 reductions in 2030. Uh, the limit, uh, well, the, re the target reduction of 40%. What will be the impact of that in the global negotiations? Well, nobody has yeah. the crystal ball, but... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we don't know. Um, so first of all, important. This is a proposal by the European Commission. So in any other jurisdiction, it would be as if the government would make a proposal, but it still would have to go through Parliament and other decision-making processes until it's a real decision. So that's the status. Um, whether 40% is ambitious or not depends on uh, the viewpoint. Uh, the Commission itself says it is ambitious. Um, if you compare it to um, different ways to share the carbon budget globally that is consistent with two degrees, I would uh, uh, classify it as being at the least ambitious end of that range. And there's a blog on the ECOFIS website where we explain that, uh, where you can look for more details. So, yeah, it is at most at the least ambitious end of what could be treated as, uh, as a fair contribution. Um, I think what the international climate negotiations need is a, a front runner, is countries that without conditions put forward very, very ambitious pledges and then try to implement them. And I would classify this uh, proposal by the Commission not yet as such an unambiguous, ambitious target. There have been other uh, countries putting forward unambitious, uh, unambiguous but very ambitious targets, and that could be, uh, for example, Costa Rica, which said they want to be climate neutral by 2021, and Maldives as well. I think those are the targets that we need to drive the international process forward. Thank you. Another question. Uh, how do you assess the potential of outside initiatives like the US-China bilateral agreement versus the UN-FCCC in driving significant emissions reductions? Yeah, I think uh, China and US are uh, the most important players. Uh, they are the, the states with the highest emissions. That's why I think uh, a um, looking at these two countries and having them uh, talking to each other and thinking about this bilateral is always good. One should not forget um, that um, it is not about only emissions, it's also about the impacts of climate change and that the international climate negotiations that in include all countries, that is the place where the, one can discuss how to deal with the impacts of climate change and how the countries that are responsible for climate change can help those countries that are most impacted by climate change. So the international negotiations are very important for this kind of a question, but I think that a bilateral agreement between US and China can definitely help and support reductions, but it cannot replace 
inter and international agreements under the UNFCCC. Okay, good. So we have many entry questions. Uh, I think we will have for uh, a bit longer than expected. So maybe we can can we Niklas target uh, a quarter past four um, as a reasonable time. Uh, from my point of view, yes. So I see we okay. have a lot of questions on the table, so let's go as far as we can. <laughs> okay, excellent. So that proves that the topic is of high interest. We have really worldwide audience from <laughs> all the continents and many, many countries, and each country bring in uh, interesting, interesting views. So let's, let's go for a few more questions. Okay, so... Several developing countries don't have any legislation with regards to sectors that limit GHG. So how can this effectively partake uh, in climate negotiations? I think um, um, the international climate negotiations now uh, go along a route that countries themselves propose what they are willing to do in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And we've seen that the major, the, large, well, the developed countries, they are proposing reduction targets, so minus 17% uh, for the US, for example. Then, um, and also the major developing countries, they do the same, like uh, Mexico, South Korea, um, China, India, um, South Africa, they've also proposed for themselves reduction targets. So, and they have implemented national legislation to achieve these targets. That's actually very, uh, a very positive um, development that I mentioned already. But there are other developing countries which do not uh, propose that. They propose other things. They propose, for example, to implement a certain policy, uh, let's say a certain policy to support electrification, rural electrification, also using renewable energy, or they have, support, they have made a proposal to um, uh, build um, low-income housing, but to do that in an energy-efficient way. <clears throat> um, and you can do that even if you don't have any overarching climate legislation, but you have certain areas where you want to do something and where you want to have help maybe internationally to do that. And this process of countries proposing what they are willing to do leaves it open that they can either propose a quantitative target or that they propose um, a, a, an individual action. So all countries, no matter which development state they're in, can uh, make a, a, a contribution that is appropriate to their national circumstances. another question. Uh, do you see any financing mechanism on the lines of CDM itself reviving in the near future? Um, there are some countries who, who want to, well, first of all, I mean, the CDM is, is happening uh, and is very difficult right now. The prices are very low, but it has definitely um, um, led to some significant uh, reductions and also some significant uh, capacity building or mainstreaming of the problem. So that's very positive. And I think many, some developed countries want to build on that. And there's this work stream there on that is called new market mechanisms. And um, under that work stream, they are discussing on new uh, market mechanisms like the CDM. I think right now it is a bit uh, difficult to foresee what's happening and i would lean towards it's less likely than likely that this would work well because the national commitments that countries provide on a bottom-up basis are not that uh, ambitious and we'll have to see if in 2015 countries have put forward very ambitious reduction targets then uh, there is a need for market mechanisms and emission reduction credits to satisfy that, those emission reduction targets. But if the targets are very weak, then it will be uh, difficult with a mechanism like the CDM. Okay, good. Another question on uh, how 
likely the success of Paris uh, 2015. Well, maybe we can turn the question on uh, what are the what is the context and expectations. Uh, so, how how many chances we have to to have something reasonable? Thank no, you. Exactly. The question is how do you define success? <laughs> if you define success as an agreement, no matter what's in there then I'm, I'm very hopeful that there will be an agreement, and maybe not in Paris, but maybe half a year later or a year later. That sometimes happens. Um, but there, I'm pretty sure there will be an agreement. Uh, if you call that a success, then, then you have achieved success. Second question is, will it solve all problems? Will it set the world on immediately on a pathway towards two degrees? That, I think, will not happen. And I think it will set a framework, and it will, but it will need significant adjustment afterwards to really make it into a fully operational uh, agreement that is compatible with two degrees. That will have to happen later. And the model for that is the Kyoto Protocol. It was agreed in 97, and all the rules and everything else around it was agreed in 2001, so four years later. I think that's probably something that, that will happen here as well. Okay, very good. So I, I would like to invite the audience to submit their questions through the Q&A window, please. I see some questions uh, being posted in the introductions window. So please, uh, for those having submitted a question through the introductions window, uh, please uh, copy and paste on the Q&A uh, window as uh, we are proceeding uh, first come, first serve basis with your questions uh, using this, this window. So please proceed um, copying and pasting your, your questions. If you made it in the introductions window, please go to the Q&A window, and they will be treated um, by order or of arrival. Thank you. OK, so next question. How important do you think local political decisions are in order to mitigate climate change? Uh, if you mean local political decisions at a city level, if, if that's your definition of local, then I think yes. Um, uh, cities is actually one of the initiatives that we had in our Wedging the Gap approach. One of the 25, 21 initiatives is around cities. They have an in inherent motivation to do something about climate change. They are those players that see climate or greenhouse gas reductions as a co-benefit of doing something else. Making a city more um, uh, positive to live in, uh, helping the, um, the uh, living conditions in the city or with a greener city or with more public transport and things like that, uh, better, air, uh, better air quality, that are goals directly at the heart of cities, and if they do them, at the same time, they reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. So that is a clear, uh, very important driver, but cities cannot do the whole job. It's not only cities who should do it. They can do, until 2020, a, a few gigatons, maximum two, I would say, but that's it. And the, the, the gap is much larger, so we need others, other players as well. And if you think local as the national governments, then I said this before, national governments are definitely the ones that make the decisions. Um, at the international level, that's the framework, but the real decisions are made at the national level. Okay, good. So another question, how the lack of binding legislation for climate in USA could affect international goals? I uh, always think it's very important what we mean by legally binding. Um, um, in the US, we have the situation. There is no federal climate law on climate change, but there is a lot of action in states. There is some power that the president has to instruct its institutions to, to do certain things. And uh, as we've seen, if all of that is implemented, then uh, even uh, the 17% could still be reached. Um, I think what is more important is actions on the ground. And whether that's legally binding or, or not, uh, nationally, internationally, it may, that, that question may be politically important, but I think it's not the heart of the question. The heart of the question is, are countries doing something to reduce their emissions? 
And if the U.S. can show that on not at a federal level, but at least on state level or at the level where the president can influence it, if their emission reductions are happening and ambitious things are happening, then that could also drive the international uh, debate. So I think national actions is the important part and not whether it's legally binding or not. So a comment. Um, International Energy Agency report released today says that coal will remain the dominant power sector fuel for at least the next quarter of a century. Any comment on this? Well, I haven't. I have not uh, uh, seen that report, but under business as usual conditions, um, I um, uh, would even agree on that. There's a lot of coal-fired power plants being built right now. It is a definitely an, a very important issue for climate change. We've seen coal-fired power plants have a lifetime of 40 years. If they are built today, then they are expected to run for 40 years. And we've seen in the pathways, the global emission pathways, that we need to peak global emissions basically now and then decline significantly over the next decades, in that kind of a scenario, any new coal-fired power plants will have to be shut off before the end of their life. So building new coal-fired power plants today may be cheap, but is definitely not compatible with a two-degree pathway. And that is an important uh, uh, conclusion that we, as a, as a global community, have to think about what to do in these situations. And especially in developing countries where coal is the dominant and cheap fuel and where development is necessary, where more electricity is necessary for development and uh, prosperity. And there uh, is a very important area where these countries need to be helped to do something else other than coal um, to satisfy their development needs. Uh, just a reminder, your questions are submitted, they go to a queue which is visible to the moderators and then we are proceeding one by one. So if your question didn't pop up till now, it's uh, just because other <laughs> arrived before. So just remain with us and uh, we will try to go through, through all your questions. Thank you. So another question, could you indicate some cost assessment? for the different options presented? Yes, um, that is a big question on how much will it cost to Do you need to go through the slides? Uh? No, that's okay. I, I, um, um, the big question is definitely how much does it cost? And I think from my point of view, there's one important element. What the, you always compare costs against a business as usual. And in a business-as-usual scenario, there's also costs for the energy system. So let's assume we are going towards a business-as-usual with a lot of um, uh, fossil fuels. That means you have to implement a lot of infrastructure, um, a lot of power plants, uh, things like that, to satisfy all the energy needs in a world where you have little energy efficiency. So that is definitely a lot of investments are necessary in the electricity and energy system under business as usual. Now, you can have a different world where you invest in energy efficiency, where you invest in renewable energy, and um, in the long run, those kinds of scenarios can even be cheaper because you have invested in energy efficiency. That means you, in the end, need much less infrastructure and much, le much less um, uh, energy system components to satisfy uh, those needs. And since you invest in that, the costs will go down and you hopefully in, in the end uh, end up with an overall cheaper system than you would under a business as usual condition. But for arriving there, you need to make a lot of investments now, a lot of additional, some people call that additional costs, but in, in my view it's investments that you are making now for a more uh, efficient and a more a carbon-free future. That's one way of looking at it. So there are scenarios which basically show if you do all that, you are better off afterwards 
in the middle of uh, or the, at the end of this century, you have an energy system that is in total cheaper than the business as usual one would be. That's one way. There's another look at it, and that is uh, one that you uh, get with economic models. Um, they look at it a bit more conservative, but they also find that you can reach such a two-degree pathway with um, GDP losses of in the order of 2 to 3 percent. That's the order of magnitude. So your GDP in the future would be 2 to 3 percent lower than it would be without any climate policy. That in absolute terms is a lot, it's trillions uh, of dollars, but in relative terms it's, well, we, are, we all are um, with growing, growing uh, economic power uh, by the middle of the century with, I don't know, growth rates of, let's say, 3% a year until 2050. Um, we would be at that point in time 3% uh, less rich than we would be without climate policy. So if you look at it in a relative way, it's, it's doable. So costs would not, uh, in, if you look at it that way, would not stop you, should not stop you from doing it. Oh, another cost estimate is the cost of adaptation and damages. And these damages usually occur later. So they are, if you look at the estimates, lower right now, but they can be quite significant by the end of the century. And they will increase for several years and centuries to come afterwards. So the increase in cost of damages will not stop. They will increase even further and will be much, much higher than the costs you would have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, hey, good. Thank you. A question about the status update of Green Climate Fund. Yeah, Fernando, I, I see we have uh, a long queue, uh, so let me uh, then change the strategy and give short answers. Uh, um, the Clean Climate Fund is um, operational. It has a secretariat and a board and hopes to uh, get money out of the door, I think, by the end of this year or early next year. That's probably what I would assume will happen. So it's still institutional setup and money spending not before the end of this year, I think. Can the use of shale or natural gas be a long-term strategy? If not, then how is it uh, deduced, justified? Um, again, in, in light of having short answers, it's not, uh, um, from my point of view, not part of a long-term strategy. If you uh, exploit a, long, a lot of cheap gas, that will actually uh, increase the use of uh, fossil fuels, also of coal, uh, because it will make coal much cheaper. That's already happened. Um, shale gas in the U.S. has made coal so cheap that not the U.S., but the EU was using more coal than before. <clears throat> so I think shale gas is definitely not <clears throat> sorry, part of a long-term strategy. Okay, good. So, um, I have a question. Good morning. My name is Avril Benkimo. I work for the Multilateral Investment Fund in the IDB group. Recent EU announcement to take a step back in the EU climate and energy targets to 2030 uh, will affect negotiations. Okay, I think this question was uh, addressed. Yeah, we covered it, I think. Yeah. Okay, if you have any additional comments, otherwise we will go to the next. No, let's try to go through the other ones that are still in the queue. Okay, so how we can help from the private sector uh, I think the private sector has an important role here to implement the emission reduction options that are on the table. Any company can look at their own greenhouse gas emissions and can think about what is their contribution towards uh, a two-degree pathway, and they can think whether their future emission, uh, their emissions are compatible with two degrees, and they can set themselves a greenhouse gas reduction target and implement measures. And uh, WWF, the World uh, uh, yeah, the, the uh, environmental NGO, WWF, has a program and there are many other programs where companies can sign up to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. And I think that's 
a major element that the private sector can do. How important is the meeting in 2014 in Lima for the Kyoto Protocol and for the region of Latin America? Um, for the overall process, it's important as it's one, the, the one conference before the one in Paris. So already many things, in an ideal case, many things will have to be on the table in Lima and will have to be more or less uh, agreed. I don't know whether that will happen, but in the ideal case, that is important. And second, having an international climate conference in a region is always very uh, important. It puts the spotlight on the region. It gives it um, visibility. It helps to attract uh, people's attention to it. So if these countries in the region have good, um, um, good uh, projects and ideas, that is the place where they can present them and hopefully get support to doing them. So next question, how would you see a new agreement ensure that countries meet obligations, something that Kyoto didn't achieve? Uh, one way people think about this is that they, the way that countries propose themselves what they want to do is a way to ensure that they will meet it. And we can see that already now with the 2020 pledges, it's quite likely that they will achieve them. They are at the low end of ambition but in the end they will achieve them. So, and we can think of whether that is better, a better situation than forcing countries into obligations which they then will not meet. I think right now we don't have a choice. We are really on the road that countries propose what they're willing to do and hopefully overachieve it. And I think that should be the strategy. Help countries to overachieve what they have conservatively put on the table. So, uh, Nicholas, it's uh, 15 past four. Uh, at this point, uh, we still have a good bunch of questions. Um, what do you prefer, going quickly through the remaining questions orally, or do you prefer to provide a written answer uh, in the coming days and make it public uh, in the website? Um, if you have time, maybe we can go orally. Otherwise, uh, we will go for the second option. I think we can, can go on, and I'll be brief in the answers. How, how is that for now? Excellent. And then we will solve the, the stack. Okay, good. Yeah. So, next question. Um, the Hayesan um, IDDRI report, as well as other proposals, refer to mechanisms to raise ambition after 2020 within the context of the 2015 agreement. How specifically might the 20 15 agreement facilitate ratcheting up the mission after implementation begins. Um, definitely. So this refers to uh, the paper that I was uh, quoting here. Um, it is very important that already now in the next two years, countries will make their proposal, what they are willing to have inscribed in the 2015 agreement. and. Uh, in that will not be sufficient. I'm pretty sure that, that what the countries themselves put on the table will not be sufficient for two degrees. That's why I think in the 2015 agreement there should be a process on reviewing and revising their targets and helping countries to make them more ambitious. For example, uh, there could be an, a provision in the agreement that a country could come up uh, and say, uh, oh, oh well, we found out it's easier to achieve our target, we want to uh, do a bit more, and that is then automatically inscribed in the future agreement without having to go through a decision by the COP or a ratification process. That I think would help, be helpful. Also helpful would be a, um, a review process and a process to show countries what additional things they could do to increase their ambition, so more a technical process. Another question, do you think that current financial crisis in many countries will affect the perspective of climate policies? Uh, the financial crisis has affected how countries look at climate policies. Uh, the cost element is much more prominent. I think looking at opportunities, again, is the right way of doing it. Energy efficiency, for example, is where you can save a lot of money and which is good for the economy and good for all the players that are involved, and that should be the argument. So 
looking at the opportunities, energy efficiency, save money, uh, have an investment up front, but in long term it will pay back uh, with reduced energy costs. Okay, good. Next question. While there is no globally agreed plan in action, is there any international tool or channel that can help victims like Philippines recently of future climate-related disasters? That is one element that is discussed. There is an adaptation fund, so at least adaptation measures uh, that are long-term can be uh, funded there. Um, countries say that it's not sufficient in, in volume, but it hopefully um, will um, uh, uh, work in the, pa in the future. And I think uh, the disasters is another one, but there is a UN process which handles that as well. So that's part of the discussion. Another question regarding your emergency plan idea. Could you go into details on what the roles are for the initiatives outside the UNFCCC? Yeah, there's a discussion how much uh, this, these initiatives should be outside or inside or what, what the UNFCCC should do. <clears throat> I think there should be, um, one should look at all these initiatives and one should identify ambitious initiatives that are really doing a bit more than would happen otherwise. Um, um, and they, for example, if it's initiatives on companies, they should move their companies to uh, uh, adopt ambitious own voluntary targets, put them together and show that uh, to other companies that this is really possible and that other companies will be inspired by this and also do similar things. I think they have a catalyzing role, they have a role of showing uh, that they are good examples and by that helping also governments to be a bit more ambitious in their national policies. Very good. Ocean acidification is called the other climate change problem. Is there any coordination strategy between these two issues? Ocean acidification has received very little public publicity given the seriousness of the problem. Yeah, I think the, the climate negotiations have not gone into specifics uh, of uh, the impacts uh, Ocean acidification is one impact. There's many other impacts uh, that climate change has. And uh, right now, the discussions are very abstract and not on particular impacts. But that's definitely something one seriously has to think about in the future. What is the influence, influence of African countries' emissions or climate policies and international targets? Other national climate legislations? I think African countries have uh, relatively low emissions uh, compared to other uh, regions. Some have higher emissions, but uh, in, on average in African countries are relatively low. But I think also there, uh, countries, there can be countries which are front runners which can show that um, emission reductions are good for their development and also good uh, for the climate. And especially combining those with uh, adaptation measures in a combined planned plan, I think that could be very, very useful. And so I think um, also African countries can be front runners and show according to their national circumstances they could uh, uh, they are able to also contribute to the problem and also definitely have to be helped by other countries to do that. Okay. Expansion of the Panama Canal in the next few years will facilitate the transportation of liquefied natural gas. Have there been any considerations regarding climate policies for this issue? Yeah, let me turn that question into a broader question and that is we, if we have more and more renewables, uh, we will have the situation that fossil fuels will become more and more cheap because there are less demand for it and they will come, become cheaper. And therefore, again, uh, um, being in competition with, uh, fossil, uh, with renewables. And that is a fundamental problem that we really have to think about. What do we do with the, the gas reserves? What do we do with the coal reserves that um, the owners of these resources have now uh, in their books as, uh, as values, as, as assets, 
and um, they want to make them into money, and that will be a significant problem. And there's no real climate policy solution. What do you do to keep the coal in the ground? What do you do to keep the gas in the ground? That's an open, a very important but open issue. Um, what is the EU response to the rumored 17-year pause in warming? Uh, I think, well, that's indeed a, a rumor. There's uh, different explanations on why uh, the um, uh, warming is uh, seen to be uh, pausing uh, for some years. Um, um, I think I would refer here to relevant websites that are trying to uh, uh, go into more detail of this uh, problem, and uh, I don't have the, the right address right now, but we can put it later on on, on the chat field. There are several uh, websites which explain this problem very well and why this is happening and why it is not a pause, but it can be explained. Okay. Um, I read an article some weeks ago indicating that 90 companies are responsible for 66% of the historical uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Is there a plan to make big fossil fuel and cement companies to work in their emissions? Uh, I think the numbers are more or less correct. Uh, they, uh, the, the companies are, uh, the, the highly emitting companies are really making up a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. And for that, there falls a lot of responsibility on them. One of our 21 initiatives that we had was on these highly emitting companies. And there's uh, associations like the World Business Council on Sustainable Energy is helping those companies to come up with more ambitious actions in the future. And I think there's a clear role for these companies also to act. And maybe not all of them, but maybe the front runners of these companies do something about the problem and then move the others to move as well. What do you think about the skeptics? Uh, they don't believe mankind impact so much on global warming. Is science clear in this sense? I, from my point of view, science is crystal clear on this. There's the new IPCC report, um, which um, um, makes a very, very uh, clear statement that um, on the human influence on the climate, and there is still some uh, skeptics around, but um, I think the science is very, very clear and probably can't get clearer as it is right now. So, a question on, uh, can you give some guidelines on the EU policy for the next 15 years? And also, perspective view to 2050 on EU and USA. Thank you. Well, if this can be done in a short period of time. <laughs> exactly. I think uh, EU has started already. Uh, I think it's very good that the discussion on the 2030 targets for the EU has started. Um, you can argue whether that's ambitious or not, and well, whether it should be different or more or less. Um, I think they're on a good way. I think in the US, they also should look at the long term think about a long-term climate strategy. This is, uh, I think it's not a one-year, four-year problem. It's a hundred-year problem, and you have to have a hundred-year strategy to cope with it. I think that's the major message. It's how important is the role of low emission development strategy initiative led in supporting the climate change agenda worldwide? Uh, some countries have embarked on developing such low emission development strategies. Uh, and there's also an yeah, initiative to bring them all together. I think that's very, very good. It's a planning exercise, and a plan is not yet action, but it's a necessary, um, necessary but maybe not sufficient uh, way to get to action. Um, so doing it is very, very good, um, but it also should not stop countries to do something. So if they are very busy doing the low development uh, strategy, they can, in par parallel, already do some actions which are, which are no regrets, so to say, in which they can implement. So, um, here a comment. Uh, the G77 plus China scenario is a must be considered for these policies. 
I don't know whether it's to your... Well, I don't know. I interpret this question to mean in the climate negotiations, G77, that's the, the group of developing countries in China, they negotiate as a group. And they're very diverse. They have countries in there which are low low-lying coastal island states, which are severely threatened by climate change. And they have in their countries, oil producing company, uh, countries, which have completely different points of view. And they're still negotiating in one group. I think uh, more and more there's groups within the G77 in China, which are having different views other than the group. And I would think for the climate perspective, it would be good if at, in some issues, at least, um, the group would uh, speak with different voices of their individual constituencies and not always speak as one group. But that's definitely one issue on the mechanics of negotiations that's very important, this dynamic. Okay. We have a final question, but, uh, well, I, I'm not sure I have a clear understanding. Any upcoming development? on adaptation, which concerns the common man? Um, well, there is, um, there is the um, discussion in the climate change negotiations on adaptation. So for the common man, it is at least some hope that through this international process, the government of a vulnerable country can uh, ask for financial support to implement adaptation measures. And that's already happening now and hopefully will happen more in the future. So um, in general, there's hope that this international process will help the common man to adapt uh, to climate change in the long term. Okay, thank you. Great, so I think we went through the questions. Uh, there are a few remaining, but they are just um, about topics already mentioned, so um, it's uh, certainly not necessary to, to go again uh, through these um, the same questions. So uh, thank you very much. It uh, proved to be a pretty interesting session today uh, with a lot of questions and a lot of interest from uh, all the parts of the world. So thank you, Niklas. Uh, definitely your presentation and your knowledge uh, has been highly appreciated. And now I'll give you the floor to, to close the session. As well, thank you to our audience for being there um, to, to show such, such an, an interest. Thank you very much, Niklas. Yeah, the, the thank you. Thank you. I also thank you all participants for participating. I'm overwhelmed by the mass of people. Very good spread globally. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope it was uh, useful for you. And yeah, thank you.